Hi, everybody. Welcome back to another episode of The Superficial Spirit. By the way, I just remembered I have a, I have a name for my fans that I want to call them. Little Viruses. Oh, my God. <laughs> that, are, <laughs> that are infecting the world with love, light, <laughs> fame, and glamour. Oh, my God. <laughs> I told my friend that the other day, actually that came, that was an idea I had like back in the club scene and then I was just reminded of it recently. So um, anyway, my two favorite viruses, Jess and Dan Parker. This is not working for me. (laughs) Why? Let's take back the word. Come on. (laughs) Take back the word. (laughs) For too long, viruses have suffered under the boot heels of uh, oppression by the medical community, so-called experts and doctor in medicine. But no, we are back with another episode today. Jess is back from her two-week hiatus. She Hi. was dealing with the the you know struggles of fame. Being on the show was just going to be a little bit too much, so she took a couple weeks of downtime. So thanks for joining us again. Jess, how are yeah. you? Good. Well, my mom was in town, so all my family lives pretty far away from me. So it was really nice um, to spend some time with her. And your mom is one of our biggest fans in reality. One she of is, our biggest yeah. viruses. Yeah. <laughs> she's our biggest virus. <laughs> one of our most she's virulent. Like confirmed, she's confirmed <laughs> that, you know, she approves of you, Derek. Um, so I love that. She, she likes the addition. I'm a mom whisperer. <laughs> Shout out to Jackie. <laughs> And Derek is here every week again in his itty bitty teeny weeny yellow polka dot bikini. <laughs> I'm like fine salt. Everybody eats me up, but leaves thirsty for more. <laughs> okay. All right. Hey. Yeah, that's huh? that's not bad. I can't believe I haven't fucking come up with a new Housewives tagline. Like you really, we talked about this like four episodes ago and you've been like really, you know, Taking it seriously. Mm-hmm. I love it. They're, your... so, they're so stupid. I love coming up with them. I wanted something like, I may not be God, but I'm still more powerful than you. I mean, that would totally work. Some of them are just, <laughs> there's no thought or no intellect behind them. And I just love it. I still, I think I said this last episode, one of my favorite ones is, I was raised Morgan. I was, I was raised Mormon, but now I'm raising a glass of champagne. Right. Yeah. It's so good. Salt Lake City is killing it right now. Jess, I know you don't watch Housewives. Derek, I know you watch Beverly Hills. Do you watch Salt Lake City? I do not. That's only Beverly Hills. Oh, my God. It's so good. It's so good. It's so good. But, you know, we won't talk about it because um, y'all don't care about Housewives like I do. I'm so excited to talk to you. Do you watch Love is Blind? Sorry. Love is Blind. I am not straight and I don't care about love. I watch season. so good. I, I think... There's a season two, right? I think that's what I watched. I think we're on season three now. Yeah, I watched season two, though, for sure. That's the one where they're, like, on the opposite sides of a wall, right? Yes. Yeah. It's so good. I mean, I fast like, forward through, like, half of it, but... Yeah, and, like, only one couple in the season that I watched, like, even got together or something. And everyone else just, like, really flopped. A co- like, one to two a season actually get married. Okay. Oh, that's typical? Okay. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. But yeah, How it's long been do good. they last, though? How long do the marriages last? Um, maybe well, like a year, feeling, year and a half. Yeah, there's. I think the. I think the couple from season two that I saw that is still together. You really get the feeling that they're just trying to prove it wasn't just for the show. Yeah, mm. like spoiler. Um, after that last finale, um, they still look like they're going strong, and then they give you a little commentary before the credits, like they have now filed for divorce. Yeah. <laughs> um. So it's just yeah, it's insane. I don't know if like most of these people are just trying to be actors. So they just like stick with it, go through the wedding. You know, what's crazy. I've noticed because I looked up a bunch of them on Instagram (laughs) afterwards and being a reality star does not guarantee you a following anymore. Hmm. A lot of them have like 30 K. I wish I had 30 (laughs) K. It's pretty like, it's pretty low for like someone on TV. It used to be, you could guarantee like a hundred plus, you know, Seems like no one really cares. Or maybe it's maybe it is just one of those shows, Peter, that like it doesn't really hit with like 
Gen Z, you know, like the people who consume the most media and mm. get really, really passionate mm. about it. No, I actually, the Gen Z folks that I do work with love that show. Um, so I, I, I think that um, reality, reality TV show fame is kind of a thing of the past. And now it's just about being an influencer. And then like I did ask this girl that I work with who is 25. So that's Gen Z, I think like at the top of Gen Z. Um, she was away in a really fancy vacation and I'm like, damn, like your life is so um, glamorous. You should have a reality show. And she's like, I, um, she's like, ha ha ha. Yeah, I think so. And then I was like, wait, do Gen Z people want their own reality shows or do they just want to be influencers? And she's like, I, I think influencers because there's less risk and there's no commitment. So you can become an influencer and then gotta get on a reality TV show. You have more like power but you're right i mean especially in canada i work with people who are on reality tv they do not get a following and i think it's maybe part of the reason is there are so many people who've been on reality shows now that it's like oh my god like can you um, i mean i can't even think of a number of how many people have been on a reality show on a hit show too and just like we don't care. Whereas the first people on Survivor and Big Brother were fucking famous. They were fucking hounded by the press. They couldn't walk anywhere. And now it's like, you know, half of streaming services are reality shows. So I think people there's, just. There's a thousand fucking shows to choose from on a thousand fucking streaming services now. It's not just you can only watch C like CBS as your evening TV. You know what I mean? Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Speaking of being an influencer, I was really like, I wanted to talk to you guys last week because I sent you the DMs. But uh, for the first time since I started the show, maybe second time, people were talking shit about me and the show. Maybe not the show necessarily, <laughs> but I've been posting clips about like clips from episodes um, of pieces of the episode that I think are interesting. And I had gotten wind that somebody was saying that I seemed unhinged when I was talking about Britney. Now, normally, I don't know. I don't know. There's something about it that was like, I was so upset and I was so defensive. And I texted you both in our group chat because it took me so like, I used to get made fun of all the time when I was in the club scene and like performing people talk shit about me all the time. I was used to it, whatever. It took me so long to get back, get to a point where I was comfortable, like really shamelessly putting my creative stuff out there again. And I was really defensive also because the person who was making fun of me, I found out is famous and somebody that I look up to, I'm not going to say their name on the show, but I'll tell you offline. And I was like, fuck you. Like, you know, that I look up to you, you know, that I am passionate about Britney, like the fact that they would look at a clip of me talking about Britney and be like, what's wrong with Peter? That's what they said. What's wrong with Peter? Is he okay? Like he's literally saying that he thinks that he could save Britney if they were friends and he's comparing his life to Britney Spears. I'm like, have you not like followed me for one second on Instagram? Like, hello, this is not something new. And I was like, I couldn't sleep. That well, I slept eventually, but I was all in a tizzy in the living room. And I'm like, part of me was like, good. At least people are like, you know, it's, it's, it's like causing yeah, here, a reaction. This is a good thing. This is a good thing. Yeah. You wanted to be famous. Someone quote, <laughs> that you think is more famous than you is talking about famous. you. This is Welcome a real celebrity. Fame. Welcome to fame. Okay. It's Jan Arden, isn't it? That jealous bitch. I hope not. No, it's not Jan. It's not Jan. I, no, I, but, 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 but this is the other thing. You know, when one person says something, it is indicative of what other people are generally probably thinking, not a, maybe a large part, but if somebody says something like, I think he seems unhinged when he's talking about Britney, chances are there are at least one other person who watched that and was like, uh, this guy seems a little cuckoo. Uh, honestly, I really don't agree with that. It's like, you can't negatively filter for all like, you know how it is. Like people are way more likely to comment some shit talk than they are to say anything positive. If they have po mildly positive feelings or neutral feelings, they won't say anything. So you really can't consider like a negative comment to be representative really of, of anything more than just that one comment. I don't know. I feel like, yes, that's that. Yeah, that could be true. I, when I was like spinning on my couch, I'm like, well, if this person is saying it, then other people probably think it. And like how many people are like watching this and judging me? And oh my God, the first time I released something, I can't remember if it was like an article about me or a music video. And one of the first comments I ever read about myself was like, 
he is like Lady Gaga's less talented gay brother or something like that. And I started fucking crying. I called my roommate. I was like 24. I'm like, why are they making fun of me? I thought that like when you, like back then, being an openly gay artist would automatically um, automatically mean that the gay community would celebrate me and lift me up and be like, yes, yes, honey. Opposite, opposite, opposite. We do not as, do that. <laughs> we do not do that. And I felt like that in this moment too. I was like, why can't you just support creativity? And then I'm like, I can't even imagine what people on a larger scale like Britney or like anybody on the reality shows we're talking about, you, you, you wake up one day and you're suddenly in the public sphere and people just come for you. They just come for you. They don't give a fuck. Well, I mean, I told you already that I didn't I, on DMS and stuff. I told you, I didn't think you seemed unhinged and it wasn't anything unusual Same. in the context of what, how you normally speak. And even, even if I didn't know you, I wouldn't be like, wow, this guy seems nuts. He just seems to like really be passionate about Britney and like kind of have like a gay fascination with this diva. Like we all do, we all have one. But what I think is odd, like that's happened to me also. Like I sometimes like post like kind of jokey tongue in cheek, like complaints on Instagram or I'll like do a rant to the camera. Right. But then like once in a blue moon, somebody will DM me and be like, why are you so angry? Or like someone did once say, you're giving unhinged Karen vibes. And I was like, you're ta you're just really, ta you're taking this so seriously on my behalf and you just don't have to. Like, I don't, why are you doing this psychoanalysis? I didn't put as much energy into this post as you did into responding to it, I feel. Yeah, I mean, the unhinged thing, I feel like the unhinged, like specifically is implying that you're like not well. Which I think yeah. it wasn't like, oh, he's a little crazy, but unhinged is a very specific word. And Derek, yeah, obviously I follow you. And I, I think you are very opinionated and outspoken on social media. This is one of the reasons why I love you. And I think if people look at somebody else's social media and take it seriously, it goes back to what we were talking about, the housewives, people getting so worked up about Lisa Rinna versus Kathy Hilton, because it's like they're, 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 they're treating it like it's a real thing in their life. Same with somebody watching my Britney thing or your um, posts about the world. It's like, it's just an opinion. It's not serious. It, like, please just fucking relax. Yeah, I don't know. Weird. <sighs> so I'm not unhinged. No. Just for the record. I so. No, I not yet. So. It's, just, okay. not it's a all. really, it's a weird motivation for someone to even try and like police like tone police you like that i don't even get what they want for you do they are they do they think they're helping or are they just trying to be mean like i don't know i asked myself that and it, i think it was like poking fun at me they were it was like a couple of people talking about me and my posts being like oh my god like it's so stupid he's so weird i don't know so i i interpreted that as mean-spirited i think that if they oh if they're listening to this then i'm sure they'll find out it will be um like, oh my God, that's not what I meant. That totally wasn't what I meant. I was just like, you know, whatever, being shady. Fine. Yeah, well, if, if you're if you're listening, whoever you are, just just slow your roll. Just mind your own business. I, you should have better things to do if you're as famous as Peter or, says. Or comment on the goddamn post and say, "Wow, I'm sure this is not a you crazy bitch." Oh, 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 oh. Have oh. I heard of them? Probably. I'm pretty not. sure. It starts with an O and ends with pra. <laughs> Hell yeah. <laughs> can you imagine? Uh, okay. Anyway, I just wanted to bring that up. We can move on from that. It was a little weird. Um, the other thing, and this is kind of in the vein of like getting spinny. I recently, and I can't believe I hadn't heard of this before. And I wanted to know if you all have heard of this. Hangxiety? No. Oh, like no. a hangover anxiety? Yeah, hangover anxiety. Oh, yeah. yeah I totally... I totally somebody came up with a word for that. <laughs> okay. Okay. This blew my mind a couple of weeks ago when I found out what this was. You all know that I, like, I would say my relationship with alcohol is like ever evolving. There was a point in my life where I didn't know if I was an alcoholic and I was really like, do I have a problem? Do I not? The part of me that felt like, there was an issue was anxiety based because when I would go out, I would wake up with like severe anxiety. I would be like, I would like go through moment to moment, what I did, what I said, who I saw and really judge myself, even though 
maybe nothing went wrong. Like I was just drunk at a club doing what everybody else was doing. Really, really would like beat myself up for that. And when you go to 12 step meetings, they're like, well, that's shame. Like if you have shame, then you're an alcoholic. Like obviously if you're having anxiety, you're an alcoholic. So when I was in, okay, when I was in the early stages of quote unquote recovery, I was confused about this because when people talked at meetings, I did not identify with their relationship with alcohol. I never felt like it was out of control. It wasn't affecting my relationships or my work. In fact, when I went to AA, people in my life were like, um... Why? Like, I know you like to party, Peter, but why? You're, you're, you're not an alcoholic. My mom, my best friend, my boyfriend, everybody said that. So it's confusing. Why did I have anxiety? And if I don't have a problem, blah, blah, blah. So anyway, this recently happened. I went out. I woke up. I had anxiety. I was like messaging my friend. I'm like, oh, my God, I felt like, like I was a huge mess and something went wrong. He's like, we were literally sitting in a corner talking <laughs> all night. Like, there was nothing. And I um, had seen... I don't know if it was on Instagram or like just online about anxiety and I fucking go to this Reddit, like this Reddit thread. And I'm like, oh my God, this is such a common thing. Alcohol induced anxiety where people catastrophize the night before, even if nothing happened. And it was like, it blew my mind because I felt like that is what I was experiencing and other people experience it. And some people choose not to drink because of that. It's really intense. And that's kind of like what I'm leaning more towards is if I do drink, I need to be really aware that it increases my anxiety and I'm already an anxious person. But I wanted to see, one, do you both experience this? Actually, yeah, that that's the question. Do you both experience this? Yeah, that was like my whole early 20s. Definitely gives you anxiety. I think I had the same experience as you. You wake up the next day, you're just replaying everything in your head. You feel like shit. It might even, even if you don't drink every day, um, I think it just like the anxiety like lingers. So I did stop drinking around like 28. It's when um, the whole paleo diet became popular and stuff like that. So I really straightened up my diet then. And then, yeah, you just feel so much better. I have way less anxiety now that I like barely drank. Um, so don't worry, Peter, (laughs) it happens to everyone. And I don't think it means you're an alcoholic at all. And yes, it feels so much better not having that alcohol induced anxiety. Yeah, I, yeah, it's totally normal. I get it too. I, I don't, it's for me, it's kind of unattached. I don't, it doesn't really like make me think about the events of the previous night. Cause truly I'm, I'm really exactly the same when I'm like drunk, even if I'm super drunk, people really don't notice a change in me. But the next morning, it's the physiological or I guess the cognitive effects. Just I have this unattached sort of free floating anxiety that makes me feel like I, that, that, that there's a shame, but I don't I don't attach it to any events. And it, it just feels bad. I feel sad for the whole day. <laughs> this yeah. is th- like Derek, you you described it per- perfectly. It's like it's a it's a chemical thing that's happening in your brain. And because we're human, we're like, well, what what is this caused by? Like, what did I do? Why do I feel this? You feel it because you drank. Like it's just a chemical thing that's yeah. happening in your brain. That to me is like, what? If I would have known that, I mean, knowing that. One, it informs you to like, you really need to think about if you want to drink, do you want to experience that? Because some people like Derek, you said it's free floating. It doesn't really affect you. Like you feel sad and anxious, but it's like, man, it's just part of your hangover. Well, it's, it's just not, it's just not regret. Yeah. I don't, I'm already an anxious person. So anything that I do, this is why I can't fucking take um, THC in any way, because it just amplifies that feeling. And I hate it. I hate, hate, hate it. So I have to be really mindful of it, but it did make me feel better that it was very common and I didn't, I just didn't know that. And also really hoping that people are empowered to choose not to drink, even if they're not an alcoholic, because when I was in the club scene, it was like, well, if you're not an alcoholic and you don't have a problem, why would, why would you stop drinking? And I think I, I think there's still that mentality. Well, you know, when you choose not to drink, people automatically want to know like, why? Why, why wouldn't you drink if you can drink? Do you have a problem? No, I just, I just don't want to. But it's a harder, for me, it's a harder, um, what's the word? When you don't have like an explanation other than, no, I'm just choosing not to. It's like people don't respect it as much or it's harder to stick with it. You know what I mean? Whereas if you're going to meetings and people are telling you every day you're an alcoholic, you're like, I can't drink, I can't drink, I can't drink. So it's easier to like go down that path than it is to just choose not to do something because just because. Yeah. I don't do it. Cause I don't like it. I mean, I do sometimes like less than once a month, I'll like 
be hungover, but yeah, it's, you know, I, I don't feel any pressure to do it. That's why we all need to live in the same city. Yeah. So, so we, we can, can play board and... games. So we can, yeah. <laughs> By the way, there's a Britney monopoly coming out. So oh, wait, what? That. Maybe that was a, maybe that was a fake meme actually. I'm pretty sure. I, gotta look. I don't know. We'll see. Sure. <laughs> Um, I posted this week something to my story that Elon um, tweeted that I thought was a joke, but apparently he's real. He said he was going to buy Grinder and uh, um, get rid of all the bottoms, and I just thought somebody had like edited it. <laughs> and They're I was like, really "Oh, this is true." But Derek, <laughs> Derek, you said it was true. There really is a Britney monopoly. Okay, there is. There really is. Thank you. And it's, not, and it's on, it's available for pre-order. So you're right. It's not out yet. It's a thing that's coming. If she's making, okay, she's this, this is either the weirdest it. thing ever or the most logical thing ever. If she's making her own business decisions. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I guess she would have to, cause she doesn't have a manager anymore. Yeah. Or no, she does. Like she does something... have a manager. It's her best friend. That's so weird. Because like, it definitely what, wouldn't what is, be a tri what, what is go to jail? Is it like get forced into rehab that by Jamie? Oh my God. Too. Go to daddy's house. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I actually want to look into that and see who who's making who's making that <laughs> do, decision. Do not pass go. No two hundred dollar allowance from daddy. Like <laughs> credit card gets taken away. Um. So Elon, let's talk about Elon because that <laughs> that tweet prompted I you. I don't like billionaires generally. Um, Derek, you and I talked about this. Oh, that was another thing that kind of sparked my, uh, another like stuff in my DMs about me um, not liking billionaires that kind of continued. And I've been listening to Anarchist podcast recently to see if I truly am aligned with that way of thinking. And I'm, I'm learning a lot. I'm not ready to really talk about it yet because I really want to have a better understanding. Like when I say I have an anarchist spirit, I was just saying that because I felt like the feelings I had were aligned with it. And I'm, I'm learning more about it and I'll speak to it more, but Elon is one of those billionaires that I've just like, you know, he bought Twitter for like way more than it was worth and he just fired a bunch of people and it's like this careless, I don't know, this just like he has all the money in the world and he's just doing whatever comes to his mind, including wanting to buy Grinder and getting rid of bottoms. Wasn't that a joke? I, I well, can't obviously it wasn't a joke. That. Oh, <laughs> okay. See, maybe it was a meme, but you said well, he's that's, like, that's, that's his thing. His thing is like cringy, cringy boomer memes. Like he, you know, I'm surprised he didn't put that on a SpongeBob picture, you know, like that's just what he does. <laughs> he just thinks he's so fucking funny. Anyway. Um, yeah. So I guess he like bought it at a loss. Um, he's such a doofus. Like he, he uses the thing for status. Right. And that's not how most people use Twitter. P people actually do use Twitter to curate their news and in making this a status thing you have to pay for, he's going to alienate a lot of people. He's like cut all the security measures. He's cut moderators. You know, yeah, he cut out like 3,000, 3,700 people. He cut like all the moderators and security. And it's going to create a situation where if anyone can be verified, then nobody's verifiable. Do you know what I mean? And there, there's a, there's the midterm elections are coming up and people legitimately look at Twitter to find out information on what their polling station is up to. If somebody just jumps in there and gets themselves a checkmark by Monday, which is when it's supposed to happen, by the way, midterms are on Tuesday, then people can just be like out there trolling with a checkmark and telling people wrong information about where to go vote and shit. Like it's chaos. It's potentially so really damaging. Can you explain what he's doing with the chat marks? You basically just buy the chat mark. Anybody people, can yeah, buy he, it. Everyone can pay eight dollars to subscribe to like Twitter check mark, and you get that check mark, and it's literally everyone. And it's coming from this stupid like faux populist, you know, faux free speech, you know, giving the power back, you know, from the elites who have their blue check marks based on Twitter favoritism towards liberals and shit. This like, uh, uh, you know, it's just it's. Sorry, I almost, I almost said a, a politically incorrect word for how I feel about the, the wisdom of this move. <laughs> but like, yeah, so it's just this faux, yeah, it's this faux populist thing. They're like, it just it totally removes uh, uh, the legitimacy of the platform. 
So the eight dollars is yeah. for the check mark. I thought it was eight dollars just to like even be on. No, it's it's eight dollars for to be verified. And the other thing is now it's it's going to be a symbol of you being a massive loser. Like people, if you pay right. for a, if you pay for a blue, if you're paying eight dollars to look cool on Twitter with a blue check, you it, you're it's just like wearing a dunce cap in public. So what are, what are the downs? What is the downside to making a blue check mark available to anybody with eight dollars? Well, because I mean, think of uh, bots and trolls just getting verified, right? And then scamming people with like harmful links or pretend impersonating somebody with a position of, you know, let's say political authority or some sort of, you know, scientific authority and spreading misinformation, right? So it increases the chances of misinformation being spread because it's the illusion of authority, because we're used to the check marks being given to people who are um, verified of being a, per a, a person of a certain social stature, either a celebrity, an artist, a politician, influencer, whatever. And now that it's available, I can buy a check mark tomorrow and say, I'm Peter Breeze of the Superficial Spirit Party, and I don't think you should get vaccinated. Um, I think that you should come to my house and party with me instead, because that's the best way to avoid getting coronavirus and then people will be like oh well this person has a check mark i guess that i should i don't know i guess he's knows what he's talking about because uh you know going back to the idea that people don't do the research and they take everything online for right. face value so if you have a I don't blue think, check mark i don't think check marks mean correct information i just think it means no, they don't, you're yeah, like they don't a mean... celebrity and it's verified that it's actually you and not someone pretending to be you but yeah. then, yes, to what you're saying, people trust celebrities so much. Well, that it's not just they celebrities; it's, it is politicians, it is newsmakers, it is well, journalists yes. as well, right? So it doesn't it doesn't signify this person's information is good. It signifies this is who they say they are, and someone else with a right. handle that looks very similar to theirs, or using a handle that is you know that is their exact name, that person is not the real account, right? That's what it guarantees. What if what if Peter Breeze was like a political leader? who wasn't already on Twitter? What if you just don't like Twitter, you don't have a Twitter, and someone jumps on there, taking the Peter Breeze handle, Peter Breeze official, and they're verified? Right. That's something well, that Jess would do for sure. The check marks will become meaningless, and then like, yeah. who would even want That's to buy it because it's meaningless? Exactly. It's sort of like every, and I've said this before about TikTok, that if everybody has a following, then nobody has a following. Like if anybody can just get 20,000 followers for posting every day for an entire year, then does it take away the value of those followers? And Derek, you said, well, not necessarily if they're really engaged in your content, then you have an engaged audience, regardless of if everybody has it. I think in, in what I'm envisioning, if everybody on Twitter has a blue check mark, because he's also making it very affordable. Like $8 is not that much money. And I think that if you go on and everybody has them, I I don't know. I, it's definitely going to take That's away. a lot of money. Really. $8 a month? You guys don't even want to watch Oh, it's $8 a month? Yeah. It's $8 I'm pretty a sure. month? Yes. <laughs> yeah. Yep. Oh, I thought money. one time. I thought it was a one time. Oh. Oh. That's more expensive than um, some of the OnlyFans. Like, yeah, you, know, you can I get mean, well, it's like a, a lot more like than a check mark for that. Spotify or something, like, where you actually yeah. get something. And also I because know. everybody knows that Twitter is, like, not making money and in the toilet. This is obviously his way of, like, trying to generate some money. I'm really curious what this is what this is going to do. Because the thing about Elon, and I don't know a lot about him, but from my limited uh limited capacity of like really understanding his whole life journey like all the shit that he does he is a visionary uh in the sense that like he wants to bring people to mars as an example so he's a billionaire who's like i feel like a teenager with lots of ideas he's like i'm going to i'm going to build a rocket ship and we're going to send people to mars if somebody has that much money he actually could potentially send people to mars if he wanted to and with twitter it's like he bought something to see what he could do with it like almost as a social experiment what would happen if i did x y and z and so i feel like it's gonna be wild watching what he does not only with twitter but just in the years to come because he's well, be limitless yeah 
that to, to be that. clear, he was to be clear, he was forced to buy Twitter. He was trying to back out of the deal because it was such a losing deal, and he got taken to court and forced to buy Twitter. So he didn't fucking want it, first of all. And secondly, like I agree. I mean, he's in a way a visionary, but we can look at his history of like the things to which he has applied this like faux futuristic vision of his and see that like none of them have come to fruition and they've explicitly been lies for political purposes, especially in the case of like, what was it? Transportation in San Francisco or in LA or something like that made some lie about like rapid transit, a transit rail specifically to like get certain political like um, things realized. And like, it's just, no one should have that much power. Right. Like, and it's purely because he has the money and the platform to tell these like, grandiose lies none of which have ever materialized right like it's like he just that, wants, um, it's literally just yeah sorry go ahead no sorry i cut you off but it's like that one woman and now i'm forgetting her name who started that like um where you can test your blood for certain for like cancers and oh, stuff. elizabeth holmes honey elizabeth holmes so she yeah. had an idea but they didn't actually have the technology and elon does a lot of stuff like that so he is enough of the ideas and technology to bring kind of like some of these cars to fruition but like none of his cars are actually like self-driving or anything like that and people are getting hurt so yes like Derek was saying like he has these big ideas and they're just ideas and they're kind of like fake <laughs> you know because he I, can't get them done so he's all like for show and again he was kind of just like almost I feel like he was joking around about like buying Twitter he's like yeah yeah everyone look what I'm doing you know and then they're like called his bluff like okay you want to buy it here well you put in your bid so we're not letting you back out so here you go buddy like called his bluff um Bro, and what happened like. like the instant he the instant he like officially you know took over the usage of the n-word just skyrocketed on that day right because people are like look what we can fucking do and he like the reason for him taking over twitter in the first place for making this gesture for being like hey, hey, like you said jess like hey, i'm gonna i'm gonna take over twitter and i'm gonna be so cool like he was posturing as making it like an unfettered free speech platform but what happens people start saying the n-word and they still keep, they're still getting banned like it's it's not even he can't even accomplish uh, the uh, free market of like uh, ideas on Twitter that he like that he was posturing like that's not even feasible like he doesn't recognize the idea that like that like there's limits to free speech when it limits other people's freedoms you know what I mean so it's just a doofus well, he has to find that person to fire them whoever's blocking the bad I guess so stuff because yeah. he's been firing people daily um, and today or yesterday yeah, maybe he's it was in the same bucket in my head as Kanye and Trump, basically. Oh, absolutely. And did you read like a bunch of massive advertisers, General Mills, um, Volkswagen, one more, I think, enormous advertisers with like contributing a huge amount of revenue to Twitter have just pulled out. Good. They're gone. Yeah, well, yeah that's now why even, he needs to charge $8 now. <laughs> it's even less. No, well, that's that, that. This is after. He already had that plan to charge $8. They only pulled out like today or yesterday was the news that dropped. And now it's even less profitable. <laughs> I take back what I said about him being a visionary. He's not a visionary. He's just rich. He's just rich and he has ideas. But like if any. Yeah, but I mean, if I, I mean, who wouldn't with billions and billions of dollars be like, oh, maybe I can send people to Mars. Like maybe <laughs> I, I feel like when you are a billionaire, it's only natural to think of outlandish ideas and ways to spend your money. Um, and I, I think. Because it's I more feel, than you can spend on anything reasonable in your lifetime. <laughs> yeah. And I think maybe a visionary is somebody who is doing something that is innovative and changing the world for the better, not somebody who's just rich and trying to spend money and make headlines. Yeah. And a lot of people have visions. We know that from the superficial spirit. A lot of people have visions. <laughs> Doesn't make them credible. If <laughs> only the tarot readers and the psychics and the fucking, you know, people who talk to the fairies were billionaires. Just imagine what the world would be like. Like $44 billion <laughs> could house everyone. Like. Yes, God. This is why I said yes, on the last Jesus. episode, he hates you. Like he just, he's totally down with you dying in the cold on the street. Like that's actively what he's, he wants. They all do. Even Oprah? Well, in a way, I mean, she's a massive uh, capitalist and neoliberal. So kind of, yeah. I mean, I don't, I'm not familiar with her, familiar with her like charitable work or anything like that. But yeah, I mean, she's a billionaire, isn't she? It's not really possible without uh, uh, hoarding. Yeah. 
Hoarding. That's the thing. Hoarding. Please share. Um, any other thoughts about Elon Twitter? No, let's talk about aliens. Okay. Thank God we're finally here. The aliens. Okay. So I, I was on um, some long flights last week and I was, I'm trying to move away from true crime because I was listening to a lot and I started to feel a little guilty ever since Dahmer came out. I was like, I don't feel like this is good. Anyway, so I was looking for different podcasts. I was listening to some anarchist podcasts. And also I found a podcast called Somewhere in the Skies. And I was trying to pick an episode. Oh, that we listened to that. You and I? Uh, or you and Steve? My husband and I, yeah. Okay. So I was trying to find an episode that wasn't like, you know, in the 50s, a couple said that they saw something on the road. And I found one of the, one of their recent episodes is about a documentary called Moment of Contact. And I listened to the episode and I'm like, okay, it, this is interesting. Um, the guy, the documentary filmmaker, it's his second film. The first one was called Phenomenon and I haven't seen it, but I assume it's about like the UFO phenomenon. So this, this whole documentary is about this thing that happened in Brazil in 1996 Basically, people saw a UFO in the sky. It crashed in the city. What's it called? Valinha? Valginia? Like, yeah, it sounds like Virginia, okay. but like Viking or something. <laughs> now <laughs> it's just like in, vagina. The, the UFO crashed in like Virginia, Viking, Brazil. Yeah. <laughs> so the story is I'll give, I'll give like the premise. So people who are listening who haven't seen it can sort of get, and Derek who also hasn't watched it, even though we've asked him 32 times. Um, it's and just dollars <laughs> on Amazon. <laughs> it was six ninety nine for me in Canada. I'm trying to save up to come to Palm Springs and visit you. Don't make me feel okay. guilty. Okay. So, okay. The UFO, uh, you know, some farmers hear this thing outside, no, see this thing outside. It's cigar shaped. They don't know what it is. They've never seen it before. Um, different people in the neighborhood see it at the same time, like around the same time. They all describe it similar, like it's a it's a cigar shaped. It's kind of like going not too high in the air and it's sort of like going over the town and it looks like it's looking for something and then it, it eventually crashes. Somebody um, sees it crash and goes to the site and they see basically something that is cigar shaped that and and this debris on the ground that looks like aluminum so slick steel looking thing he picks it up he crumples it and it kind of like goes back straight um the person in the documentary who who goes back to the site and talks about it is crying because it had such a profound effect on his life and he's like you know telling the story and how you know the effects that it had on him also in the documentary, there are these three girls. And actually, I remember seeing this on YouTube, like when I still lived in Vancouver, when I was really into like looking up UFO stuff online. These three teenagers are walking through a park type area and they see an alien or a creature. They refer to it as a creature down like against the wall. It looks at them. It has red eyes. They get freaked out. They don't know what it is. They run away. They get their mom. Um, they describe it as having like oily skin, um, red eyes, small. And everybody in the documentary says that there's like a very strong stench of ammonia and sulfur. So these three girls see it. That's one part of the story. The other part is this guy. And Jess, you can correct me if I'm wrong. I think they're just regular people or maybe it was the military who are driving and see this thing walk across the street it and was, he go. Yeah. It was the, like the local police, like looking for it. The local police. Lo okay. Cause they had gotten reports that there was something. People were seeing something in the neighborhood. They didn't know what it was. It was freaking everyone out. So the police go looking for it. They see it walk across the road and then they literally capture it with their bare hands. So this is like, when you read the article, you're like, wait, these people are literally saying that they caught an alien with their hands, put it in the back of the cop car, go to the fucking hospital to, I don't know, what, what were they doing at the hospital to see what it was or to see what was happening? Jess, can you- That was like the what? weird part for me that we didn't get like the hospital 
explanation. Oh, I can't talk right now. Um, which was when we were trying to tell Derek about this, he kept saying like, where's the doctors? But they, after some <laughs> unknown hospital visit happened, they did go and take it to get x-rays, which I think they left it in like a body bag. And so they did interview um, the radiologist who x-rayed the bag, but didn't see the actual alien and was not allowed to develop the pictures but he also um so that there was that lingering stench for like days so again to peter's point like a part of the reason this was so believable for me is because so many different people had like the same exact story the same exact details of the smell the way they looked the oily skin um but so Derek's just going to, like, love this, like, that, the hospital part, was kind of, like, a weird mystery to me. And I'm wait, 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 wait. Like, where are the doctors? <laughs> there was a doctor who said, like, the they asked, like, the doctor asked them to leave or something. Like, there was, like, some exchange. That, that wasn't a big part of the documentary. But the guy who held the alien died. Yeah, he from- died of an unknown infection. Mm-hmm. Can An I ask? Unknown alien infection. Was the so you said there were two cops who took the alien, yes. right? Yes. And so did the one who didn't did the one who didn't die tell the story himself? Themselves? They go to his house. They go to his house. They confront him on camera, and he says, "If you're here to talk about the ET, I'm not talking about it, and I'll shoot you." <laughs> Basically, he threatens to kill them. So they leave. Um. I feel like what was believable to me is, and this also goes back to why I tend to believe people who have paranormal experiences in general, is one, something that happens with a bunch of different people who don't know each other. And also, Derek, some of these people didn't want to be on camera. So like the fame thing wasn't part of it for for some of them. Some of them were very happy to be on camera. Um, is what do these people get from Derek is petting his cat, his pussy. Um, What do these people get from making it up? Like these three girls who are walking through the forest and see the alien, the person who apparently picked it up and died, the military officer who's like, I can't go on camera because I'll get fired and or killed. All of these people talk about the, the, the ripple effect that this had on their life in a bad way. They all wish it didn't happen to them. It was very traumatizing. Nobody believed them. They've made been made fun of their whole lives. And it's just sort of been like this dark cloud over their life. I feel like I believe that. Why, why would these people make it up? And I do feel like they were being honest. Like maybe it wasn't an alien. Maybe it was something fucking else. But I do believe all these people saw and experienced something. And there are examples of mass sightings in the world. Like there's one over Arizona where like an entire town saw this giant thing floating over their town that could not be described. And I felt like at the end of the documentary, my thought was I 100% believe that a UFO crashed. I 100% believe that they found something. And I think that, (laughs) ah, I can't believe I'm going to say this. I do feel like with the recent acknowledgement of the what do they call it now aerial phenomenon aerial flight whatever they changed it from ufo to something else with the government acknowledging that yes there is something we don't know what it is we're investigating it we're divulging money into it i think that it is possible that maybe they are inching towards some kind of disclosure and this is the whole thing about the ufo community when are they going to tell us that it's true? When are they going to acknowledge that it's true? And after watching this documentary, I was like, I believe it. I think the yeah, UFOs same. come here. I think that aliens have been here. I think the government fucking knows. And they're just trying to find the right way to tell us. Because when they say, yes, creatures have, like something has come from outside of Earth, landed, and we have physical evidence of some kind of being. What will that do to the planet? People like me will be happy and we'll talk about it on the show and be like, see, I told you. But what about like the deeper, deeply religious people who can't fathom an existence outside of like the human Christian 
um, idea of what humanity is, it could potentially cause mass hysteria. And that's always like the excuse that the government officials who do talk out about it say is like, if we disclose this, it will be pandemonium. So Jess, I'm curious to hear what you think, but I finished that and was like, yep, believe, sign me up. I get it. There's aliens. Well, yeah, same. Like it helped that it was like in 1996 because we also recently listened to another thing about Roswell and I'm like, oh, like, I don't know. So coincidental that like something was in the air near, you know, a top secret Air Force base. Like, mm, you know, it's so hard when it's so long ago. But since it was just in 1996 and they still found all these people to talk to, that definitely helped a little bit. Um, but yeah, leaving that at first, like I, I told you through text, when I first started the documentary, I'm like, oh, I don't know about this uh, production. <laughs> I was like, it was a little oh, yeah. boring. Very low budget, very low budget. Yeah. Yeah. Low budget, like not the best documentary. But then when they started like interviewing more people, you know, again, I was just like, oh, shit, like, I believe this for all the same reasons that uh, you've stated just like why would they be making and the thing up? about eyewitnesses like we take eyewitness accounts very seriously and and in any other circumstance if somebody sees a crime being committed if somebody talks about i don't know that's a good example of somebody seeing a crime we take eyewitnesses seriously if somebody tells you that they were walking down the street and they saw you know an uh outrageous occurrence we would generally take them seriously so why is it i guess this is a question for you derek and i don't even know if this is one of the reasons why you're not going to believe it but why are we so hesitant to believe people who are telling us that they experienced something that was obviously traumatizing to them obviously invoking some kind of emotion that didn't improve their lives they didn't get paid they didn't get fame in a way that it enhanced their life they're not writing books they're not doing the touring circuit and talking at ufo conventions they literally just were like i experienced this they told the news once and they came back for this documentary. Why don't we believe them? Because my my instinct is, if somebody tells me something, and I feel like they're authentic, I'm going to take their word for it. I think if someone says they saw something on the street and we believe them, it's usually something that can happen and has ha we know has happened to people. So if someone said, I don't know, I witnessed a rob or a mugging or someone exposed themselves on the street or something, we'd be like, yeah, that's a physically possible thing that sometimes happens. So I think that's why we tend to believe them. And then what we do is investigate to find out if it's true before we make any, you know, uh, criminalizing or legal decisions or treat them for something or whatever, right? It's investigated and verified at that point. Um, uh, you know, if they say I was walking down the street and I saw, you know, a cow get lifted by a tractor beam into a flying saucer, we say, I don't know if that, that probably didn't happen. Right. But if they just say something mundane, like, yeah, that's why we believe them because it's possible. Um, but in terms of like, I mean, I guess regarding like, why would they make it up? Why would several people make it up? Have you ever met anybody who you thought was exaggerating just to be part of something they didn't experience? Do you, do you, uh, definitely do you know about anyone who exaggerate, exaggerate, anyone who yes. anyone who lied about having a relative in nine eleven? <gasps> no, oh, not, not, not personally, personally. But we know that happens, right? Sure. So I mean, that's all I would have to say about that, honestly. Like, and I guess my other thing is, like, this is so not only the possibility for just wanting to be involved in something special that happened to your little sleepy town, but and correct me if I'm wrong, but it, it seemed to me that. Mm -hmm. This was a, a town, like a small town in a rural part of Brazil. Yes. Yeah. Which yes. is a country with pretty low education rates. And it just looked to me like some farmer's wives talking to the camera. So. Eh. Do you. I don't know. I still want you, Derek to watch it. And then tell I us. want Derek to watch it too. But, but, but. And, and I feel like, Derek, this is kind of like in the vein of like when we talk about like if people can be psychic and if they're mediums and stuff like that. But like separate from this specific documentary, do you think what what's your thought on like extraterrestrial life and the um, UFOs that have been confirmed by the government? And they're like, we don't know what they are. We're, we're studying them. What's your general well, opinion about that? I mean, I think it's extremely unlikely that we'd be alone in the universe because there's just billions, trillions, countless, basically infinite stars. And the idea that there wouldn't be other rocks floating out there capable of support with the conditions to support life is very unlikely to me. I think, of course, there is. 
uh, life. I don't think that necessarily means any civilization or any form of life has ever developed the capacity to travel those distances. Um, and I think that one of the confounding factors to me for the idea of a government or a military cover-up of, of aliens or um, visitations is the fact that governments, world governments, including the United States government, funds research into, with millions and millions of dollars, funds research into unidentified or unknown things, right? Uh, I was listening to a podcast yesterday, so it's a good uh, day to have this conversation with you, uh, with a Harvard astrologer called Ari Loeb, I think. I love, and, um, I, yes, I read his book. Yeah, okay. Yeah, so what Obviously. he does, and he was talking about the millions of dollars he's received in grants to study like this, uh, this, this, objects they couldn't really identify near our sun i think they yeah. could they could they could hypothesize that it was you know harder than iron but they they're only taking guesses about what it's made of so mm -hmm. is this just an interesting rock or is it uh, a piece of equipment from mm -hmm. an unearthly spacecraft and why is it moving because it has no thrust and you know hypothesizing that is it moving because it's being pushed by light does that make it yeah. a sail is it intentionally designed to be a sail like so mm -hmm. the government funds this stuff to try and find these answers that we don't know the answers to when we see something that we don't we don't recognize, right? So I, I find it unlikely that they'd be covering up stuff like that in, let's say, Brazil. Do you, okay, if the U.S. government did find a UFO that had crashed with aliens in it, what do you think their reaction would be? How would they handle that? Carefully. I think they'd handle it carefully. I mean, I think it's certainly possible. I mean, I guess I find it more likely that the government would feel that, you know, it's a, there's the potential for an outbreak of like mass hysteria. But I don't know why we think that really. I think that's, that seems to me like something we, that seems to me like something sort of transmitted into us by pop culture like why do we think there would be mass there would be pandemonium shit burning and people you know shooting and burglarizing <laughs> each other and societies <laughs> falling and crumbling just because of aliens wouldn't we all be very excited wouldn't we just wouldn't a bunch of scientists just do the rounds on cnn and shit like i think that i think that now yes now there would be a more neutral response because we're so used to hearing about ufos that Everybody on the planet in some way has had to contemplate, are we alone? What do I think of the UFOs? Is there aliens or not? And have already sort of come up with some kind of um, idea or belief about it because it has been part of pop culture, like you said, for so long. I think that why would it be mass hysteria? The, the people that I would be concerned about are the um, religious fanatics who would not be able to explain it with religion if something well, but is... But Peter, I think we've seen their capacity to explain everything through religion for hundreds and hundreds of years now. It's God's will. It's God's plan. God made it. Like just because the universe yeah. exists and other other uh, beings live in it doesn't mean this isn't part of God's uh, plan to glorify humanity through uh, their you know worship of Him or whatever, or vice versa. But look at himself. how scared they are of trans people and gay people. It's like they are so scared that they would have to have gender neutral bathrooms that they're like freaking the fuck out. So they. I, I think if there's an alien, these people would, the same people who are scared of trans folks would be scared of a fucking unknown being that came from God knows where and has who knows what intention. Well, you I mean, I think people are afraid of like gender variance and diversity because people feel as though it's like, a natural human thing. It's like very, very socially ingrained in people who have traditional values. But I don't know that alien, the existence of aliens would occupy a space like in their philosophy that would be quite as controversial to them, right? I don't know if we would necessarily compare those things. And I would yeah. also say that they will eventually come around to trans people and they would eventually come around to aliens as well. They'll just find something else to say is, uh, is satanic next, you know? Wait, I think we're at the point where if aliens crashed and they like sent out a video on the news and it was real, nobody would believe it anyway. We're like, <laughs> no, it has to be fake. Because I was thinking, because there is a supposed video of this 1996 Brazil occurrence that they think is out there. But if they do play it, it'll probably, you know, not be in today's quality. And people will probably chalk it up to be like, no, that has to be fake. Like, unless I see it in person, it has to be fake. So I feel like even mm. if they do give out this information, because of everything 
that's real and fake and with every sort of like news and story and what's on TV and what's not like, we're just going to assume it's fake unless there's like literally that's- aliens walking around and living next door to me. Yeah. yeah I mean, it would just, it's like, hmm. that's a good point. I, it would just be very interesting if the same people who have been saying you can't trust uh, the government, you know, the president's always lying. Everyone's always lying suddenly went, but we think they're being truthful about the aliens. Like, right. <laughs> Right. Uh, yeah. Would it? Would it? Would it be mass hysteria? I don't think it would be mass hysteria. I think some people would have extreme reactions, but I think generally people are. I don't know. It's the same. I keep bringing up the psychic thing because to me, it's like the same kind of world, like unexplainable phenomenon that people have claimed to have really intense and profound experiences with that we can't prove. Um, people have had to wrestle with this idea internally. So I feel like if it was on the news tomorrow, um, people's reaction would either be like, yep, you know what? I always kind of knew, or "Eh, I don't believe it because I never believed it anyway. And yeah, there's so much fake news out there, fake news. Um, It could be easily disclosed and overlooked and moving on, you know, moving on to the next thing, Kanye's fucking tweets, anti-Semitic tweets. Right. (laughs) So that's that on the UFOs. <laughs> yeah. Derek, I still think you should watch it. Uh, maybe. <laughs> Do you it think just looked, that... it really did look boring, I honestly. It wasn't it wasn't honestly. I, I did have to break it up into two huh. two things. And Evan, I'm always like, please can we watch it? Because he's just so like, this is so it's not even that he doesn't believe it. He's like, why is it that UFO documentaries have a budget of $5. Yeah. Like why can't they do like a really <laughs> fucking good one? And it really pulls people out of it. Jess, you're right. It's like you started and it's like, Oh my God, this is so bad. It's just like, is this a student film? Like, please God, but we'll see what happens. Maybe this documentary will like incite some kind of social conversation and we'll see what happens. I would love to see the video. Oh my God. The video of the alien at the military base. That is what I'm waiting for. If I saw an alien, I would simply take a clear picture of it. I mean, that's what I always ask Steve. I'm like, well, how come it doesn't happen more often? How come it's always just like, yeah, in the remote part of Brazil or any remote part of the world or the small town, the only land there. Well, there are Um, lots of videos. There are lots of videos of UFOs, tons, millions. There are. There's lots of them. Of aliens, no. Right. Yeah, yeah. I don't know why. I want it's the, the same with the ghosts. aliens. Yeah. It's the same with ghosts and Bigfoot. Um, like I have a friend I want to bring. Ooh, that'll be a good person for me to bring on. My friend Joey believes in Bigfoot, sends me shit all the time. I'm like, Joey, this is literally a Halloween costume in a forest. How can you possibly believe it? But he he believes, honey. And there's, um, Jess, I don't know if you've listened to it, a podcast called The Sasquatch Chronicles. Mm-mm. Ooh. <laughs> That's something we can look into. Uh, anyway, it was nice seeing you all for this this long hour of love and light and exchanging of. Oh god, I was going to say exchanging of viruses, but I'm not going to say it. <laughs> <laughs> it makes it sound like we're all making out. <laughs> Hell yeah, Jess, you can't get viruses from. Ma- what, can yeah, you? You, yeah. <laughs> like mono, right? Isn't that the testing disease? You I don't believe get, in science. You can orally transmit <laughs> STIs. <laughs> Oh my god! Okay, let's end anyway. it. Or we're it's getting awkward. <laughs> okay, we'll see you next week, everyone. Bye. Love you.